Ready? Can you hear me? All right. Hey, thanks for coming today. Um, don't turn off your computers and don't run. Bill is here. He just asked me to open it up today, do something a little bit different, a little post-COVID kind of thing. And uh, I'm just going to um, open us up in prayer. We'll let worship, and then we'll have Bill preach, and we'll have a great time today, right? Yeah. Amen. So uh, bow your heads. So, dear Lord, um, you know, I thank you for today, Lord God, and I, I thank you that you brought people here, Lord, to hear your hear your word, Lord God, and we thank you for the people online that's listening. Lord, I just lift up our worship team. I lift up Frank and Kim, Lord God, that they will uh, just bring glorious sound to your ears, Lord God, and just I ask that people just sing loud and just hear us hear us up there in heaven lord god and i just thank you for that and i thank you for for bill i thank you for what the message he has lord god and we just ask that it just be a glorious time in your name amen stand up and sing Oh 
Jesus. I'd rather be here, Father God, than any place. Thank you, God. We long for your presence, Father God. We thank you for a sweet fellowship this morning. I'm the saints, Father, but there's just no better thing in life, God, than worshiping you together with the believers. Our eternal destiny, our eternal state will be so much of that. And I thank you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. Better is a word.
with all that's in my soul, my body, strength, and mind, my legs
Guide us in your hand. Show us now your glory. Draw us to your throne. Cause us to know in the powers of darkness. Hide us in your hand. You want to come up, bud? Um, yeah. Uno momento. All right. Um, I want to give an update really quick on the Dorland Ministries. We had an amazing breakthrough. Um, but first thing, do you have that, Bert? All right, no problem. So... Um, one of the things that was hindering the Dorland ministry was me. Um, I wasn't giving everything into it because I kept, well, I kept convicting myself and, and uh, judging myself and condemning myself. And there's a reason why I wore this shirt today, because I have to keep reminding myself that Christ paid it. 
We all have demons that we fight. We all have struggles we fight. We all have things in our life that we fight and that we sin and we fall and we stumble. We trip. We do all kinds of things. Just like this guy here. I always look at, at someone walking the uh, line here. That staff that goes on is supposed to assist him in balancing. A wind can come by and just push him completely off, especially especially that picture. But we have brothers and sisters that are willing to try and hold us accountable, encourage us, and to direct us on the path that we're supposed to be on. One of the things that I struggle with is because of the homelessness in this valley. I know that you guys are probably almost tired of hearing about it, but um, just this last weekend, was it this weekend? Thanksgiving, um, I got a call from First Step for Life. Dorland Ministries is to help those that have slipped through the cracks of traditional uh, um, financial support and aid and so forth, and especially for single men. And I'm not, I'm not saying that we're designed just for single men, but single men with no children, these guys have nothing. This guy got out of jail. He spent his time in there. He wants a fresh start. He was waiting for his payment from the state to be able to pay for his month's stay in a motel. Well, he got out. The mail says not been there because of the, the holidays. And Sean from First Step for Life called me and said, Hey, do you guys support this? Do you guys, can you guys help him? So we put him up in two nights in a motel room. And it was all because of donations from people like you and people that are online, evidently. And um, I just got good news over the weekend that we've been trying to get a warming shelter together, but we can't call it a warming shelter. We have to call it a, um, oh, what did he say? Anyways, there's different laws and regulations for that because if it's a warming shelter, you have to have a kitchen, you have to have a bathroom, you have to have all this stuff. It's just some place for them to get out of the cold and take a nap or sleep overnight and stuff. It's not for that. So we have a shed. I've been working with uh, Ziggy's where I work. We have this shed that's been there, and I've been praying for them. So I hope you guys join me in prayer for this, that they donate the shed. We have enough funds now to be able to buy it, but then we don't have enough funds to repurpose it. So it's a catch-22, and God's still working. I know it's his thing, but... We're also supposed to pray with perseverance and specificity. Did I say that right? Yes. That's encouragement right there, baby. Specificity. Expialidocious. Anyway, so um, so I just want you to know that today we're having another meeting for Dorland Ministries at Rosars at noon today. And if you're interested in more information about Dorland Ministries, if you're interested in volunteering, if you're interested in donating, please do so. Again, it's above and beyond the tithing here. We've always had, we, we're still going to be doing the backpacks. We're right now, we went to Big Five and we ordered some, uh, they were out of backpack or sleeping bags and tents. They had some tents there for 20 bucks that um, um, five degree. Was it five degree? Five degree and up sleeping bags, mummy bags that were only for twenty five bucks. They're normally sixty bucks. So we went ahead and ordered six of each. Right? We already got two of um, sleeping bags, I believe, two of the sleeping bags. But big five. Here's how God. <laughs> I'm sorry. The manager there broke the rules for us. <laughs> they normally don't give rain checks because they're out of it completely. And they had some in the in the factory, they had, or not the factory, the distribution warehouse, and they had some in other stores. And he said, "You know what? We're going to go ahead and rain check it. I'll talk to my I'll talk to my district manager later. We'll go ahead and do it." So. They've got six of each coming, and it's interesting because I know right now there's at least four that really need it. And I praise God. (laughs) God works. In spite of ourselves, he takes care of us. So I just want to encourage you guys that don't give up. And if you're being convicted and condemned and you have 
people that say, you're doing this? <laughs> Praise God, because through that perseverance and through your past and through everything that goes on in your life, they're not your judge. They either want to come alongside you or they fall away from you. But God makes that path clear for you, and he also makes it straight, just like that guy right there. You have your brothers and sisters of accountability and encouragement on each side of you. But he also says, right, does he not say, narrow is the path to me? I don't know how much more narrow you can get to that. But if you look, there's plenty of, plenty of space on each side to fall, isn't there? So I want you to know that God is good. He's true. He's real. And Jesus is, Jesus is alive, man. Thank you, guys. Noon, Rosars. <laughs> Amen, Tony. Thank you. Um, good news shared with us. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be informed uh, about what's going on, Tony, uh, a lot. And um, always good to hear that. The, uh, we sang a couple of songs uh, that had to do with the covering of our God. Uh, one was uh, about his wings that cover us and protect us. And the other one was being held in his hand. Um, and brought to mind a story that I think you've probably all heard, but I think it typifies exactly who our God is at any moment in time in our life. And that is in the midst of fires that raged in, in various communities, there happened to be a farmer who's entirely probably all heard, but I think it typifies exactly who our God is at any moment in time in our life. And that is in the midst of... <laughs> that was really weird. <laughs> Those of you at home, are you having as much fun as we are? Um, huh? <laughs> yeah, really. Felt like I was watching an international film for a moment. Um, if that happens again, let me know, because that was kind of fun, actually. I kind of enjoyed that. Uh, anyway, it's a story that many of you have heard about a, a farmer whose entire acreage and property and, and most of his animals were, uh, were taken out by the fire. And um, as, as he's wandering his property and looking around, he's just kind of moving stuff around. He looks at what was used to be his house, his barn. Things are burnt down to the ground. He's got, uh, used to have old saddles in his barn that were from his grand, great-grandfather on down and so forth. And just all this, all this, one, resources that he had and all the work that he put into everything he and his family, and uh, just devastated, you know. And so he's wandering around, and he's kicking things here and there, looking at stuff, and he, and he comes to this area where the chicken coop used to be, and here's this chicken, black, okay. arms are spread, or wings are spread out, and he just kind of goes like this and kicks it, and outrun three little chicks. Outrun three little chicks. That's our God. The, our God is willing to go to the cross to give us life everlasting, to give us hope, to give us grace, to give us the, the opportunity to be alive and to worship. To um, First of all, I don't like wearing masks. I want you to know that. When every time I bring this up, it's not so much that I hate. Bill Reed must really enjoy wearing masks. <laughs> it has nothing to do with that. Um, in fact, I have this raw nose right here that I have to put stuff on almost, uh, I don't know how many times a day. I know it fogs people's glasses up. It's hard to talk intelligently through them. Um, and, and oftentimes, uh, at, at, at least in, in a class, it's hard to hear students talk and, and to catch facial expressions. I tell a joke, which I think is funny, and you can't see anybody laugh. And that's hard. you know. I, at least I might be able to hear a chuckle, but it's hard not to see at least somebody smile. And uh, so it's hard. I don't like it. And... and the masks make it impossible impossible for us to forget this very depressing reality of COVID. It's hard because it's there. And, and the uncertainty of when it will be gone. I also hate that masks have become, become such a divisive political symbol, whether you wear it or whether you don't. And I think it's just an unfortunate thing, and I pray as Christians we don't get caught up in that. Because the masks look at them, those who don't wear masks and think of the worst. Those who wear or don't wear masks look at those who wear masks and think about the worst. I can't tell you how many times I get laughed at when I walk into certain stores. <laughs> and I don't mind it. I'm okay with it. Uh, I'm okay with them laughing at me. I've, I've, I've had some situations in which people will say, are you an idiot? <clears throat> and I say, yeah. <laughs> you bet. 
<laughs> How about you? And your, your pastor every now and then, or at least your, 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 the guy that occupies his pulpit, uh, sometimes lets his uh, silly smart alecky self out of the bag in those circumstances. It's silly that we have come uh, into this situation, but I'm also not surprised because everything is, is polarizing and everything is politicized. Um, I understand also that the avalanche of information about the effectiveness or the ineffectiveness of masks causes us just to go, wow, I can't wait through all of this information. It's kind of like this. Sorry. <clears throat> if, you've gotten into, uh, if you've gotten into Medicare, <laughs> and I'm looking at Medicare, uh, man, I, I, sifting through all that stuff uh, is mind-boggling. I, I have a tough time being able to um, read all of it and really understand it. What I want to be able to do, and we hopefully have an appointment this week, to be able to sit down and say, hey, I'm 65, uh, I'm working, don't know how much longer I'll work, but I envision myself working for a while, I have full health coverage for both my wife and I. Um, what is it I need in Medicare? And what's the supplement that I want? Okay? Um, I forgot how old I was. <laughs> I went up to Lewiston High School to visit and watch one of my interns. This was a week and a half ago, and I ran into Mike Murphy. Some of you know who Mike is. And we're just sitting there talking about masks, because everybody's mandated to wear masks, both in the city as well as at that high school. And... Uh, we're, he's t telling me a story about his dad, uh, who was a good friend of mine, um, and, and, and his health being, is deteriorating and so forth. And he told, he told about the coverage that John had with Medicare and the supplement. And I said, which one is it? You know, he said, F. And I said, really? I'm going to write that down. He said, you can't get it anymore. I'm like, shoot. Okay. He said, well, how old are you? Uh, I'm 67. <laughs> and I, as soon as I said, I went, I'm not 67. <laughs> well, how old are you? Uh, and then he had this, this real quick. He teaches math. He says, well, when were you born? <laughs> Let's start there. 1955. Okay, and we're on a, uh, a 20 number bill. So I don't think you're 67 yet. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, I'm 65. <laughs> Wading through the enormous amount of information in that, as well as what we get on the media, what we get in, in written, we can find all kinds of information on it. Um, it's no wonder that with all of this diverse expertise that's out there. And again, I'm not a, um, a medical professional, uh, but I hear probably 90% of all medical people say masks are effective, okay? I'm not a medical professional. I don't really like wearing them. And so with this shortage of, of uh, consistent messages or hypocrisy from our leadership and so forth, um, I want to go back to one thing, and that is, like Nick said, his word. That's what I will always go back to, is his word and what it is that he tells us. Um, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures here, and then we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 3. Okay? I'm going to read uh, a couple of uh, verses from John 1, Colossians 3, and Hebrews 4, about the word of God. John 1, 1. In the beginning was what? The word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. The line that grabs me is this, let, okay, the word is let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. The only way that it can dwell in this is if I let it come in, if I open up my mind to it, if I open up my heart to it, if I read it, listen and obey. Only through obedience to his word can we really gain strength and growth in our life as a disciple. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. As we're going to read about here in a little bit, and we're only going to read a little bit of, uh, of the Church of Philadelphia, this church practiced these verses. This church was obedient to the Word of God. And, and God, uh, as we're going to read, Jesus loved them for that. This is one of those churches that, um, like, like Smyrna, didn't have anything negative about it. Okay, So we're going to read in, in chapter 3, verse 7. I'm going to read verses 7... Um, Till about 10, I think it is, somewhere in there. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, 
He who is holy, he who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one said, opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no one can shut, because you have a little power, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews, and are not, those who are religious, but you really, excuse me, don't have a relationship with Christ, say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them to come and bow down at your feet. And to know this, this is such a powerful thing, and to know that I have loved you. Jesus wants them to understand this, that they have not denied his word, they've kept his word. Verse 10 says, because you have kept the word of my perseverance. This church did not depart from the word of God. It not only sought to worship God, but really sought to obey his word, to follow his word, to know his word and to apply it. And to practice it. And so, as Christians, uh, I think it's really important for us to rise above the political fray. To rise above that and not get caught up in our eyes on the things that people are doing. Especially because they're not, they're not in moral laws right now, as, as far as masks are concerned. Our city council, people that we elected, if you live in this, in this city, uh, passed a mask mandate for the city. And I'm going to talk about our call to obey authority. That the word of God says, not me. The word of God says this, not me. But as Christians, to rise above that is really important. And to think about what our faith means. And what God's word would call us to in regards to wearing or not wearing masks. It's always going to come back to individuals. And I understand it. That's okay. And as much as I dislike wearing masks, which I do. As much as I dislike that. And I sympathize with some of the skepticism about them. As well as I cringe at attempts to shame people into wearing them, or not wearing them. I love walking into some of these stores and people will come out and, you know, I can hear them barking about, yeah, make sure you wear your mask. And I said, I will. When I look at scripture, I don't see a mandate for masks. There's not, hey, you know, Jesus doesn't say to the disciples, who do you say that I am? Well, you're a savior. Well, then you should wear your masks. Or you should not wear your mask. That's not anywhere in here. Wouldn't it be simple if that were the case? It's not in here, Okay. What is in here are three things. Okay, and those things are this. Love your neighbor as yourself. To respect authority and to use your freedom for the sake of gospel. I'm going to expand on those things. I'm frustrated by the fact that science on whether you wear masks or not or the effectiveness of it has been inconsistent. It's maddening that the U.S. Surgeon General, the WHO, uh, and, and the CDC all kind of flip-flop on all those things. But it's not surprising. This is a brand new, fast-moving, changing kind of virus. And we probably won't know for years. That's one of the reasons I, I get really tired of how people slam Trump for what he did. I think he stepped into the foray very quickly in a way that said, I'm going to shut down travel from particular places. Okay? But they love to sh slam him simply because of what has happened. <laughs> it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. It was going to happen. But I do believe that the consensus that is emerging is that masks have an effectiveness. I'm really proud of the college over here. Uh, we were uh, mandated to wear masks uh, at all meetings, all classes, all activities, and so forth. And, and I remember way back when um, talking to many people who said, how long, and we'd ask questions before the semester even started, we said, how long do you think we're going to last? <laughs> Maybe three weeks, four weeks at the most, people would say. Okay? Lewis Clark State College is one of the few colleges in the country that stayed active and face-to-face -face up until last week. That's pretty phenomenal. Open and still active. Being in, in person, one-on-one. -on -one. That's an incredible thing because students and faculty and staff were willing to wear their masks when they were inside. And I think that's valuable. Um, so I'm going to read Matthew 22, 34 through 40, and a couple of other ones in terms of uh, this loving your neighbor as one of the concepts associated with how we handle our freedom and what we do when we come inside small buildings like this one, okay? That we think of others before ourselves. Matthew 22, 34 through 40 says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, Teacher, which is, a, which is the greatest commandment in the law? 
Jesus replied, Love the Lord with Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And this is what's a powerful statement at the very end of this, is all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Our willingness to obey God, to love him with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves, to think of them before ourselves. Later on, I'm going to read uh, uh, from Philippians about the model that Jesus is for you and I. In that he chose to go to the cross. He chose to be that chicken who stayed in the midst of the fire to protect everybody else. He sacrificed. He sacrificed and he calls us to sacrifice for each other. John 15, 12 through 14 says this. This is my commandment, Jesus again, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that a person will lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. John 13, 34 and 35. I am giving you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, by this loving example of others before myself, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's important that we understand that as Christians, we're called to love our neighbors, and I've, I've talked about that before. I hope you have good neighbors. They're easy to love. If you have those kind of neighbors that are hard to love, you're still called to love them. <laughs> That's hard. That's a tough thing. To love our neighbors as ourselves, particularly in indoor spaces. I went into Rosars the other day. Rosars has a mandate, has a mandate as it does the city. But there are also, understand that there are health reasons for some people not wearing masks. Understand that. What I, what, I, what I struggle with is when uh, this, this person was up near the, the checkout stand and, and she came in and, and somebody recognized her and, and uh, um, said, how are you, how come, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, our whole family has had COVID. We've all had it and we've all come through fine. We're not wearing masks anymore. You guys shouldn't wear masks. And they just got into this argument. The other person standing over here was a former teacher at the junior high here, one of the junior highs here. And she's wearing a mask and she says, well, wait a second. My sister is in the hospital with COVID on a respirator. It's okay that you got over it, but don't come in here and make me feel bad for doing this. I hope that that other person was not a Christian. I hope. Because she was a clanging symbol, a sound with no love in how she delivered her message. Instead of coming alongside someone who, who, who and just saying, yeah, man, our whole family had it, and we got through it, I know other people have had it, and maybe you're suffering, some people have lost, that's a different approach to shouting out and having as a clanging symbol for a voice that distracts and isn't loving. Submitting to the Word of God. This church in Philadelphia leaned into God's Word to live their life each and every day, and to be recognized as folks who understood God's law and were willing to obey it. So the first thing is that we are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. Second thing is that we respect authority. I want you to turn to Romans. These are hard ones. Okay? Romans calls us specifically to be obedient to those that we have put into power, those that we have that God has placed in. So Romans 13. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnations upon themselves. That causes me to be afraid. That line right there will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause for fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do, which, do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you have, will have praise from the same, for it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. Wherefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Again, render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due, custom to custom. Fear whom fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. I think we honor our God when we understand that passage. 
to be able to, um, and I think it's easy. I mean, it, the, all of our political and, and media landscape is all about trashing one another. There's not much encouragement that goes on on the media. There's not much uplifting that goes on. Regardless of which media outlet you watch, they're all hammering on one another. There's, there's, all, there's blame to go around everywhere, but all it seems to be is certainly just making such abusive kinds of statements towards one another. Certainly, leaders make mistakes. I've made them all the time. I confessed a mistake not too long ago. It is important that we understand that leaders will, because they're human, will make mistakes. But never forget this. God has put them into place. Mm -hmm. God has placed them there for his purposes. And this circumstance, this situation, is a, set, is a series of complex and fast-evolving issues and question marks that surround this thing called COVID. 1 Peter 2, let's read that one. 1 Peter 2 has some nice past, nice verses in it that have similar kinds of impact that we just read. Verses 13 through 17 of chapter 2. Talking to those, those believers who have been scattered about, okay? Submit yourselves to the Lord for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. I see that, and I, I read and understand that we are to respect human governments. Now, we are not being asked to, one, you cannot carry this anymore. You can't read this Bible anymore. You Like in other countries, people are persecuted and punished for having one page of this. One page of this that they have torn out and hidden in their shoes, in their socks. You and I have the freedom to walk around with this anywhere we want. Not that we always bring it to church, but we can do it. We can bring this. We can take it and read it anytime we want to. We have the freedom to be able to do that. We have the uh, uh, freedom still to be able to meet, to congregate. I want to keep doing this. I want to keep move, keep meeting like this because you encourage me when we meet. I love getting uh, uh, handshakes and hugs and elbows, uh, elbow, whatever those are called. My, I think mine could spark fires if I ever had another one. With somebody who's just as bony as I am. Yeah. But we are called to be submissive, submissive to governance. As long as the laws are not immoral or go against the law of the gospel of Christ. Okay? That Rosar's interaction, again, was just that whole aspect of people not really respecting one another, let alone the authority. Um, the third thing and the last thing is that, as we alluded to just now, I'm going to ask you to first turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. It talked about freedom. It talked about freedom, that we handle our freedom correctly. Uh, that we understand that freedom is not just to do whatever we want, but we are set free. First, first Corinthians 9. And I'm going to read verses 19 through 23. One of the greatest things that any pastor loves to hear is the turning of these pages. 19. Paul, who had every right to use his freedom to ignore authority, because he was an extremely knowledgeable, uh, wise man and somebody high up in the, uh, 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 the religious order of things. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win the more. I could stop right there. Even though I am free, free from all of us, and we are, this guy says, I have made myself a slave, in other words, to serve others, to honor others before myself, to be made uncomfortable and inconvenient, inconvenienced, so that what? I might win more to Christ. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. That to those who are without law, I lived as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that may become, that I may become a fellow partaker. 
Paul could have used his freedom to do whatever he wanted, to live above the fray, to live above all that, that he was called to do, and as to sacrifice himself and his personal comforts for the cause of Christ, for others to come to him, to Jesus. Paul's example, to me, seems like he's pretty happy to give up that freedom in order to win others to Christ, to be able to love others well. It was his missional power. It was his mission directing towards that. Few things are more beautiful to witness than someone who is giving up their rights and freedom for the sake of another. I read this story that I thought was powerful. Um, it comes from a book that I read a long time ago called uh, Holy Sweat uh, by Tim Hensel. Um, it's about a World War II Japanese prison camp. Okay, um, And there's a story that never fails to uh, move people. It's about a man who through living, it, giving it all away, was literally transformed, he literally transformed the whole camp of soldiers. The man's name was Angus McGivelry. Angus was a Scottish prisoner in one of these camps filled with Americans, Australians, and Britons who had helped build the infamous bridge over the River Kwai. The camp had become an ugly situation. A dog-eat-dog -dog mentality had set in. Allies would literally steal from each other and cheat each other. Men would sleep on their packs and yet have them stolen out from under their heads. Survival was everything. The law of the jungle prevailed until the news of Angus McIvillery's death spread throughout the camp. Rumors spread in the wake of his death. No one could believe this big Angus man had succumbed and passed away. He was strong. One of those who had had, they had expected to be the last to die, the last to breathe his life. Actually, it wasn't that the fact of his death that shocked the men, but the reason that he died. And they finally pieced, pieced together his story. The Scottish soldiers took their buddy system very seriously. Others, they took their buddy's sake and uh, system seriously. Their buddy was called a mucker. And these soldiers believed that it was literally up to each of them to make sure their mucker survived. Angus's mucker, though, was dying. And everyone had given up on him. Everyone, of course, but Angus. He had made up his mind that his friend would not die. Someone had stolen his mucker's blanket. So Angus did what? Gave him his own, telling his mucker that he had just come across one that was extra. Likewise, every mealtime, Angus would get his rations and take them to his friend, stand over them, over him and force him to eat them, again stating that he was able to get extra food just for him. Angus was going to do anything and everything to see that his buddy got whatever he needed to live. But as Angus's mucker, mucker began to recover, Angus collapsed, slumped over, and died. The doctors discovered that he had died of starvation, complicated by exhaustion. He had been giving of his own food and shelter. He had given everything that he had, even his very life. The ramifications of his acts of love and unselfishness had, startling, had a startling impact on the, on the compound, and others began to follow his lead. This was a witness, a powerful witness for Christ. We're not called to give up our life yet. We're not called to be put into prison yet. There will come a time in which that's probably going to happen to us. But it's at this time some, uh, an opportunity for us when we have, the, have, have it before us to be obedient and to love others well and to use our freedom for the sake of the gospel. Finally, I'm going to read uh, Philippians chapter 2. This one is, is about Jesus and what he could have done but chose not to do. And Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 8. If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which also was in Jesus Christ, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made into the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. I want... Uh, our world to see Christians as those who unite, those who have um, an understanding and, and, a, and a willingness to be obedient to the Word of God. I love that, that um, 
as Nick talked about his style, he alluded to my, uh, my style being more from the Word of God. Uh, and I like that. I, I, at first I thought, huh, I think the Holy Spirit works in me as well. But I love the comment of this being the source of my direction. of where, And I don't know it well, but I do my best to try to find out the truths of these things. We are ambassadors of Christ, called to live for others first. And not just me, myself, and I. This was hard. One hard to prepare for. But I also wanted to just make sure that you understand where I'm coming from. Where I believe this word is coming from. And I want us to continue meeting. Just like we did at the college all the way through to the end, right before Thanksgiving. <laughs> to be able to be models to people out there when we go out. To be those who don't just shout and are a noisy, clanging symbol. Because without love, that's what we'll be. Love says, you're more important than I am. You are worth the sacrifice of my uncomfortableness, my inconvenience. Okay. Um, I've asked Lewis to close us in prayer. Do you have a microphone, Lewis? I don't know about you, but I had a really good Thanksgiving. How many, how many extra meals have you had since then? <laughs> I love having extra turkey and gravy and mashed potatoes late at night when it's the worst time to eat, but I should like it. Yeah, thanks the Lord for his, uh, his work and qualify things. Um, I had a teacher when I was in middle school. Every time uh, he wanted to solve a problem where somebody stepped on somebody else's boundaries, he used to say, we all have rights, but how far they go? Usually your rights ends where the other ones or somebody else's begins. So your rights transform into responsibility. And, uh, you know, for many years I keep that right, I keep that thinking that my, I do have rights, Bill has rights, everybody has rights, but how far they reach, where they end. And uh, like I say, every time he corrected anybody, he always started with that, your rights ends where somebody else's begins. And then it's all responsibility. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all this with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we glorify your name. We praise you for who you are, our creator, almighty, provider of everything and anything we have in need. I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for encouraging us to obey you, not just uh, through a simple, uh, uh, to simply following the rules in the church, but also to submit to uh, the laws and the government. God, as long as we respect you, God, help us to do so. And uh, I pray, God, for everybody that uh, is going through some pain, whether it's physically, I pray for Carrie, Lord, give her the strength that she need, uh, that she needs to make it to the time when she's supposed to have surgery, Lord. And if it's your will that she will be healed, God, we will praise your name for that. But in the meantime, we ask the Lord to prepare her, prepare the, uh, prepare the medical staff that is about to take care of her. I also pray for the Madison uh, family. God, in the last within two months of their parents, God, I can imagine the suffering, and even though it may say uh, it's supposed to happen, uh, it, we, we see it coming, Lord, that it's always the sorrow losing the loved one, the one that seek to raise you and see you grow and provide for you. I thank you for the lies, and I pray that everybody will glorify your name for happening for such a long time in their lives. I pray for anybody else that is over here, God in church, that it needs encouragement, that all the situation of the COVID God um, may affect us. I pray that all of us will reach in your word and believe it and make it our guide for every day. 
I pray for Tony's uh, ministry. Lord, you have guided and you will keep providing for him. God, we expect those uh, miracles like the little boy that approached with the, with the fish, the fish and bread. Yeah. And you will expand God in so many ways and provide for those without a need. I pray for a church for unity. Yes. To be one spirit. To be one body. To be one mind. To be one to worship you. To be one that bows down and follows you truly. I thank you, Lord, for this uh, service this morning. And as we go home, uh, we pray that we can follow you, just like Peter, like any of your disciples did. We will struggle, but you pray for us, you intercede for us, and you will lift us up as well. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, shout out your favorite part of the Thanksgiving feast. Family. 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 Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> I said, like a duh. 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 <laughs> Turkey, gravy, mashed potatoes. Man, it, it just is such a, a good time. And, and I know this year was probably harder for a lot of folks um, uh, just because of, of, of you know, the opportunity, the lack of opportunity for people to get together. Um, we talked uh, with Johanna, uh, her pregnancy. I just want to give you an update. She's doing well. Um, you know, one of the things that we're cautious about is going over there. Uh, she's at, She has a very high-risk pregnancy because she lost her previous little one, uh, August. Um, so we want her to be able to finish. Uh, and, and for little Eloise, her name is Eloise Gray. Uh, that's such a pretty name, man, Eloise Gray. And, and the gray name comes from my uh, grandfather, my, my Indian grandfather's aunt, who was named Gray Snow. And it was a name that Johanna always really liked. And she said, what was that name? And, and uh, uh, how's it spelled? And so Eloise Gray is doing well. Uh, lots of movement in there. Uh, and that little family is doing well. Um, so uh, I, I hope that your Thanksgiving time was blessed. Uh, and I know not all of them, not every day might have been that way, but I pray that your time together with family or maybe in, in a small intimate family gathering was good um, and that you were blessed beyond measure. Uh, and may you be blessed as you leave this place. Today at noon, I wanted to reiterate that Tony will be at Rosar's at noon, right? In that little cafe area, kind of, uh, whatever it's called in there. Yep. Um, keep, him in, keep them in prayer. Keep um, Ziggy's kind of in your prayer as far as giving them that that uh, storage, uh, and that would be awesome to have that and have it repurposed for you. Um, God bless you. Have a really good week, uh, a time in which, as you leave this place, uh, that you walk out there ready to touch people for Jesus Christ, not for self, but for Christ, uh, and in his way, that we would love others well and beyond measure. May you be blessed this week in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a good day.